He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowd asked, What then shall we do? And he answered them, what, Whosoever has two tunics to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also came, and, and what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money, extort money from anyone from threats or false accusations, and be content with the wages. And the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you in the, in the Holy Spirit and fire. His waning fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn and the chafe into his and burn with unquenching fire. So, with many other exhortations, he preached the good news to the people. Lord, we pray that you would just take our time together as we look at your word and, and discuss your word, that you would apply it to our hearts. Pray that you would allow me to, to speak the words that you want and that you would use this for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 3 is interesting. It's John the Baptist. John's one of those people who I really love and, and like for lots of reasons. I'll back up. Um, because he was the forerunner of Christ. He got to proclaim, here's Christ coming. Also what's interesting about him in Luke 7 and in Matthew 11, Jesus says there's no greater prophet <coughs> than John the Baptist. Pretty good thing to have said about you. He's preaching, as, as we looked at last week and, and talked about, he's preaching a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sin. The pastor had talked about the fact that Repentance is this, you're looking this way, and you dare turn this way completely. And, and, and the turning is from our views. The people he's speaking to here are probably all Jews, or at least the vast majority are Jews. Remember what the Jews like to do? They like to keep the law. They like to keep the law, they like to keep the works, they like to think they were good just because, and, and earlier we read the passage about Abraham, they were good to get to heaven just because... They were Abraham's children. So when we talk about turning from repentance, we're talking about looking at what we think we can do to get to heaven. What works can we do? And we finally come to the conclusion that we can. Martin Luther said it this way. Luther said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he said that we are called to repent with our entire body, our entire person, so when we make this change from looking this way to Jesus Christ, it's a complete turn. Now, we may not be perfect just because we decide to put our faith in Jesus and we walk with him and we're all going to have problems. But we're leaving the law behind and saying, you know what, I'm, not, I'm going to heaven because of this side. This is the side. And, and that ought to be exciting for lots of reasons. One is simply this. We're a child of God. Do you realize there's no one richer in the world than a child of God? Because God owns it all. Now, there may be people that have more material things and more material money, but they're not as rich as we are. We have it all because God has it all. And in John chapter 14, he talks about the fact that he's building mansions for us. I don't know exactly what a mansion is and, and how it pictures and how it's going to be, but I just know this. If God is building it, it's going to be. And so when we think about that repentance, we're turning this way and God sees us in a new way. I, I, I like the idea of Star Trek. You know when they, they, they if you like Star Trek and they, they cloak things and they can't see them? 
That's sort of what it is when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we're justified by faith. When God looks down at us, he doesn't see me anymore. Doesn't see my wretchedness, doesn't see anything. He sees Jesus Christ because that's who covered me. Put my faith in him and I'm covered by him. Which is a, a wonderful thing. Love church planters. And, and, and I, I have a friend who started a church years and years ago in a very hard area. Uh, actually, when he started it, it was fairly nice, but the city sort of moved to him. And, and what he once had was going to be a, a suburb church that basically became an inner city church. And, and one of the reasons I like him is because we dealt with a lot of addiction and homeless and, and unfortunately prostitutes and all kinds of things like that. After he'd been there for about 20 years, his son finally got to the age where he became the associate pastor, started working with the teens and the youth and, and the young people, the college-age kids, and, and in the midst of this time, there was a girl who had been an addict that they started working together and started becoming pretty good friends. And eventually, he asked her to marry her. Now, she was one that had kind of a checkered past because at 16 she was an addict. She admitted wholeheartedly she regrets, but she sold herself to get money to, to get drugs. So he announced that he's going to marry her. And one Sunday morning in a church service, somebody decided it wasn't a good idea for a pastor's son to marry somebody with a reputation like that. So in the midst of the service, they stood up and started saying, we don't like this and started complaining about it. And the pastor's up there trying to get control, but there's several people voicing their opinion about this isn't what a pastor should do. And finally, as the young man sat there with his fiance, who's crying on his shoulder, he stood up and in a very loud voice said, shut up. But if you know this kid, this wasn't the type of kid that would necessarily stand up and say shut up. But he looked out across the congregation and said, you should be ashamed of yourself. You have just put Jesus Christ on trial today. Because you see, when we repent and turn this way, and what John said, he forgives. And when he forgives, he forgives completely. He doesn't hold things back. He doesn't look at it and go, oh, your past is, is going to come. He forgives completely. It's interesting, in, in, in the Old Testament, he talks about forgiving as far as the east is from the west. You all know why that is. If you start to go east, you'll never go west. You can't. You just keep going east around the world all the time. But if you go north, what happens? Eventually, you'll go south. So when he says east from west, he says, I forgive completely. And that's what repentance is. When we turn and repent for our faith in Jesus, we're there. It's that wonderful thing that we're now his child. We can say, as pastor always says, someday I'm going to hear, well done, God, good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom. That's the exciting part. That, that's the, the ministry part. That's sort of the introduction from last week to get to the message. It's interesting. There, there's a phrase in here that's not talking about dying and vipers. <coughs> It's not talking about snakes, even though I think the individuals in the group in here really are snakes. He talks about a brood of vipers here. And in the context, he's probably got three groups here. One that's already repented, one that's coming, wanting to repent, and then these brood of vipers. It's interesting. Jesus never gets angry at the government. You go to scripture, you don't find him getting angry with the government. Now I know. We get angry with our government from time to time. But he says, render unto Caesar's what Caesar's. When Pontius Pilate asks him what he says, what's he say? He doesn't get mad. In fact, some of the time he never says a word. And when he does answer, he says, you said so. But you know who he gets angry at? Religious leaders. They're the snakes. They're the brood of vipers. Even back then, you think about it, when Jesus went to the temple, what did he do? He threw them out. You're not going to make my, my father's house a den of thieves. Several historians say literally they were the first car dealers. Used car dealers. <laughs> You'll know why I'm 
When you brought your sacrifice and came in, they would look at your sacrifice and say, just, it's not good enough. You can't use it, but we'll buy it back from you for 50 cents. And we have one we can sell you for $1.50. It's interesting that one they bought for 50 cents, the following day would be okay. See, they were brood of vipers. They, they were snakes. They, Jesus despised religious leaders who did those sorts of things. Here's the sad truth. They still exist today. They exist in churches all over today. I think there are three ways, and almost all of them revolve around money. But they, they exist for, for three different reasons. One is they teach falsehood. They teach there's multiple ways to get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the no one, way, the truth, and, and no one can come to the Father but by me. That's it. Acts chapter 4, 4, 12 says there's no other name under earth that you can be saved by. Jesus. But they say, oh no, you believe in Ali, you can still get to heaven. You believe in, in Buddha, you can get It's not true. They teach a falsehood. And they sometimes teach doctrine that's false. Tupelo, Mississippi. I got to go down there and work for a little bit as people I know got given 1,200 acres of land and they were going to create a beef farm down there. So we went down to Tupelo, Mississippi and uh, Sunday morning came and we were going to go to church. And this is back when you still had yellow paint. In Tupelo, Mississippi, the Baptists basically own the yellow pages for religion. I mean, it's just there's lots of Baptist churches in Tupelo, Mississippi. So you got to pick. And, you know, you really you couldn't call everyone and say hi. So you just sort of threw a dart and said, "Let's go to this one." So we go to a church Sunday morning. Walk in. We get there. Pastor finds out that we're visitors. He says, "Hey, let's just chat. I'm not teaching Sunday school. Let's go in the office and chat." So we go in the office and chat. <clears throat> and as we get in there, he pulls out the little red book. I knew what the little red book was. And I knew already this was not going to be a good morning. And the guy I'm with, with my boss grabbed my leg and squeezed it real tight like, just don't say anything. Just be quiet. But I so wanted to say something because this pastor was going to be stupid. And I just didn't want to hear stupid. So I had to sit there and listen to him tell me about the Little Red Book. Now, any of you ever heard of the Little Red Book, Religious Red Book? Okay. Yeah, my daughter's me. <laughs> the, the Little Red Book tells you about the very first church. The church of all churches. The church that is preeminent. And it can be proven because it can trace its blood trail all the way back to John the Baptist. So he started proceeding to tell us that the very first true church was John the Baptist. And then he went one step further, and I knew it was coming, when he said, and at the marriage feast of the Lamb, here's what's going to happen. In Revelation, there's a marriage feast of the Lamb. And we don't know all the details, but we do know that all the faithful believers are going to be there. Jesus is going to be there. And, and without a doubt, it's going to be an exciting time. His picture of the Mary Feast of the Lamb was that it's basically like a big football field. And on the field would be where the feast would happen and all the Baptists would be there. Don't mean to pick on the rest of you. But you would get the privilege of sitting in the stands watching us be at the marriage feast. That was the kind of error that he decided he would preach. So I was kind and sit there and listen to all his stupidity. But when we got all done, I told the guy who was with us, and I'm going to go in the truck and sleep because I can tell you it's only going to get worse from here. It was interesting. Within 10 minutes, he was in the truck. He was like, I've had enough because he didn't even tell me the doctor of error. Some people just proclaim doctrinal error. I, I've heard pastors say it. He has never, ever preached error. I have never preached error knowingly. There's been a couple times I had to go back and clarify things after I said it because someone didn't quite understand it, and then I realized it probably wasn't said correctly. Uh, 
I, I've always had my, my truth meter up front. It's my wife. She kind of wears something on her head. When I see her, it's like, I just said something really dumb. But in a, in a morning service, it's hard to correct that. But there are those that create falsehood. They're, they're brood of vipers. They exist today. But there's a second group in that brood of vipers that are just as, as if not worse. Top 20 richest pastors in the world. Their average wealth is $83 million. I don't think we're good. But no pastor needs to be worth $83 million. Ever. There is no reason for that. Especially in light of the way they sometimes get it. Don't want to pick on people, but some people are just easy to pick on. It's kind of like, you know, I, I, I can never say I'm skinny, so it's an easy thing for me to say. But we have pastors in this country that are worth 40, 50, 60 million and have two jets, and it's not enough. Joel Olstein in Houston, Texas, didn't open his church up here at Harvey until he was shamed into doing it. Didn't give a lot of money until he was shamed into giving anything. Uh, as a pastor, that would be the first thing we do. Open our building up. When we were in Albuquerque, I, I had breakfast and coffee with police officers on a pretty regular basis. Our area was a little bit tougher, but they always knew they could come and get coffee there, and every so often, my church would become the command center for what's about to take place in our neighborhood. It was always open. This brood of vipers are those that say, you know what? I, 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 I want the money. They, they have money that... <coughs> One of the most amazing things is this church coming up with the idea of having underwear to give to the homeless. That is a huge deal. This is a wonderful thing because people don't think about this. And you can't give use because they can't take them. This is a wonderful thing to do. That This is our accounting sheet. The amount of money this church gives away is amazing. It just is amazing how much money this church gives away and what percentage. When you see pastors that have millions of dollars and don't do anything like it, Again, I, I'm not saying a pastor has to be poor, but there is a point in time where they are charlatans and, and they're stealing from their people. The sad thing is, 10 of the richest pastors in the world are all from Africa. How could you possibly do those things? How many people you need to keep giving and giving and giving? Uh, I have never preached to our church on giving from a standpoint of just a, a giving message you had to give more because we're in trouble. Because we're never in trouble because who owns it all? And as long as he's on our side, we don't worry about that. We don't worry about finances. But it's almost like they're worried about finances. Uh, think of it this way. You have private jets. Uh, when you have a private jet, you lose the opportunity to talk to people. We're getting ready, and, and, and one of the other reasons I wear something a little bit nicer and brighter because we're flying out next Saturday and won't be here for the Christmas services. And, and, and make your plans to be here for two things. Pastor will be back preaching then. But also on Christmas Eve, the offering will go to children. Again, this church is always a wonderful, thoughtful church. But we're going to be flying. And one of the things I like about flying is this. I always get a aisle seat. Always. I've seen enough of the, the, the world or from the airplane and things. So I don't need to see anything else. But I always get an aisle seat. Because it's a wonderful thing to talk religion. Talk about Christ. Because you know on a plane, there isn't anywhere to go. <laughs> you just can't go anywhere. You're, you're captivated off. Well, the only place that's better is prison, and I don't want to go in a cell and stay there, even though I've done prison ministries. But an airplane's a wonderful place because they're captivated off. You can't stay in the bathroom too long because there's not enough of them eventually they got to get out. But one of the nice things about December is you know the plane's going to be full. So you can't move to another aisle. So you get the opportunity to talk to people 
Well, I'm Jesus. How's your faith? How's things going in life? What? And sometimes you get wonderful opportunities to meet people who are just having horrible days. Give me encouragement. You have a captive audience. Why would you want a private jet when you can have a whole audience to speak to? Years ago, a friend of mine was on an airplane, and he, and he sat next to an atheist who had two PhDs. And he's talking to her about Jesus, and, and the conversation's getting pretty loud. You know, and she's boasting about her PhDs and how smart she is. And he's just a pastor, and he couldn't be that smart, and she doesn't need any gods. And all of a sudden, about three rows back, some lady said, you have two of them. They're called PhDs. Sometimes people have all kinds of weird things on planes, and we have an opportunity to instead of flying on a private jet. So there's a brood of vipers who want money, and some of them have way much more money than they ought to have, and they could surely help the poor. Now again, I'm not saying you shouldn't have money, but man, $83 million? I can't even fathom that number. When I think of $83 million, I go 8, 3, and M, because it's like too many zeros to be putting out there to think about. But then there's a third group of the brood of vipers that these, this group sort of despises me, or I despise more than any other. Also about money, but this group has the gift of healing, they say. Now, I believe Jesus Christ heals without question. I believe the children we pray for are going to be healed. I, I believe that with all my heart, I pray that way, I, and I believe it's going to happen. But I have a difficulty with those people who tell me they have a gift of healing and decide they need to rent a hall, a, a big football field, to have a healing gathering. Because they're asking people to come in, and sometimes they want you to pay a ticket to come in. Sometimes they take a love offering. And sometimes when they have a long line coming down and they're healing, and they get to a certain point, they say, we'd love to stay, but we got to fly away because we have another appointment. Now, I prayed for the gift of healing. I, I really don't know if I've met anybody who had it, but I prayed for it because if I had the gift of healing, you know where I'd go? I'd head to the hospital. And I'd go to the hospice wings right away. And then I'd go to the pediatric wings, and then I'd go to the cancer wings, and if you had to get the healing, why wouldn't you go to the hospital? And maybe not take a camper with you. And you'd go and you'd heal people. Boy, if you truly have to get the healing, there's a lot of sick. You don't need to rent an auditorium to do this. There are plenty of places you can go to heal people if you truly had to get it. And, and, and these are brood of vipers. These are pastors still today that... that Say and do all kinds of crazy things. And if Jesus were alive today, and he is alive, don't, bless him, don't say that, um, he would be angry like we ought to be angry. They, these are people who just cause havoc with what they do. But John continues the message. Doesn't spend a lot of time on the brood of vipers, but. They're a horrible part. Jesus did not care for the verb brood vipers. But he moves into the next section, and it's interesting that the people ask him, what shall we do? Now, these are people who have made this decision to go from this way, the law, and said, boy, Jesus is it. They turn toward Jesus, and they ask a simple question, what should we do? And, and Jesus says two things. He says, if you have two tunics, two coats, Give one away. And if you have extra food, give it away. In a simplistic form, you know what he's really saying? Be kind. Just be kind. Just sometimes listen. Just, just be kind to people. If you have extra, give it. He's, and it's interesting. He's talking about coat and, and food. He's not talking about giving you money. He's just saying, you got an extra thing. When we moved here, I had no short sleeve shirts. 
I had only long sleeve dress shirt. So guess what? I have a lot of things to give away. Long sleeve dress shirt. After being here for a little while, I began to realize maybe I should have kept some of them because it actually does get colder after you've been here for a while. <laughs> so I'm fearing a couple years down the line. But I had plenty of extras. And, and, and so you give, and it's just being kind. It, 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 just being kind. Just giving away something to be kind to, to those who are less fortunate. And sometimes it's just being kind to our neighbor. Just having enough time to say, how you doing? When I was in school, the chancellor of the school preached a message on not lying when people ask you this question. How you doing? He said, I know what happens. He said, somebody asks you how you doing and what you normally say. Oh, I'm doing great. He said, be honest. Came back a week later and said, it's amazing. He said, I've had 42 kids in my office. They're not doing fine. And so when we ask the question and they're honest, Sometimes you just got to sit and talk and listen. <laughs> I still get awed when I listen to some of the stories that you all go through. When I listen to the, the sacrifices. As we told people, we're the nursery in Church of Grace. We're a little bit younger. Some of the stories that you have me in awe. Because the reason I and my daughter and my grandchildren get the privilege to meet like this, to have the things that we have, to do the things we have, is because of the sacrifices you made. Just being kind. It, it, we were talking earlier to George and Linda about every university ought to come over to this church. And they ought to walk into the church and just start looking at people and going, will you come with me? I want you to come to my class, lecture class, and just tell them something. Just give them a little of your wisdom. Because there's so much wisdom here. So just being kind enough to listen, to care, to have a cup of coffee, to, to, to share a meal from time to time. Just, just caring. Give a little of, of, of that caring and, and, and help you. That's good. What are you going to do? You have two yeah. kids? Give one. You have food? Give it. Just care. Isn't that what Jesus did? Uh, Jesus is always talking about the least, the children, uh, caring for them. And, and that ought to be our attitude. We ought to do something to say, yeah, I don't want to care. I mean, like Jesus, not like the Vipers. Just want to care. It's interesting. There's two other groups of people that come to him and say, Tax collectors. Tax collectors come and say, how much you... And, and you got in, in the first century, a tax collector was like the worst of the worst. There was no lower profession than a tax collector. Because a tax collector, all of them, sort of money. They took more than they were supposed to get. Kind of like our government. Even though he doesn't say government, he says tax collectors. But they asked. They come to be baptized. They come to do this. Turn from here to Jesus. He says, don't take more than you're supposed to. What you really saying? Just be honest. Boy, being honest is a wonderful thing. It is the, 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 the greatest thing in the world. Through the years, I've had to work with difficult managers. And, and the manager that lies half the time is the most difficult. Because now you've got to figure out what to lie. But tell them the truth, you don't ever have to worry about it. So just be honest, just, just do what you And then there's a, a, a third one, he says the soldiers. In this context, probably soldiers maybe are more like police. Because they were one that kept the peace in, in Jerusalem at this time. And, 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 and they said, what do we do? And he said, don't extort money. Don't, don't force people to give you money or, or any of those things. Again, when you sort of put all these together, what are they about? Being kind. Uh, just be kind. Boy, this is that time of year where being kind is a wonderful thing. I, I guarantee you there are going to be people who are going to be stunned. Because this doesn't happen very often. I know I keep grabbing these, but uh, this doesn't happen very often. And, and, and as Pastor said a couple weeks ago, this is the only church I've ever been in that did an underwear and sock drive. <laughs> just haven't heard of it before. 
Um, but it is a wonderful thing. Being kind to people is, is probably the greatest thing we can do. Because it's amazing how thankful people will be. Through the years, as a pastor, God has allowed me to give lots of things away. We had a lady in our church that would write several $500 checks to families, and then she'd usually give me one or two others that had no name on them. So I got to write in names of people that I knew that needed them that she didn't know about. And it is always fun to take a check or, or, or any of those things and give it to somebody who you know has had a horrible year. But it's just as fun sometimes to sit down with someone who's having a horrible week and say, how you doing? Let's have a cup of coffee. Hey, let, let, let's go eat a donut. Let's just spend that. Being kind. John the Baptist is preaching about Jesus Christ. He's, he's telling us there's, there's one coming. He, he, he's the reason. In, in the last verse, it says that John preached the good news. Pastor says this all the time. The good news, the gospel, is done in word and deed. I am convinced the better we act as Christians, the easier it is to give the word. Because if you act like a lunatic, they don't really want to hear about Jesus. But if you act like you care, it's amazing how they want to hear. So, so being kind and caring is a powerful thing. Acting that way is a powerful thing. I want to end with a story. Some of you may know it, and you may know it after I start to tell it. It's called the tablecloth. Years ago, a young couple, a pastor, started a, was called to start his first church in Brooklyn, New York. Got there, and, and when you're, you're called, you're going to go start your first church, and it's your first ministry, you're excited. I mean, you're just you're through school, all those things, you're going there, really excited. They get there, and they're excited. And then they see the building, they get there in October. And the building hadn't been used in a long time, and they were like, okay, we got some work. So they had to start working on the building, because the building wasn't capable of being used, so they're working on the building. And at the same time, they're trying to advertise because they've decided that they're going to have the first service on Christmas Eve. And it's a smart time to have services because a lot of people will come to services on Christmas Eve. So they had Christmas Eve service. They were excited about it. Everything's going well, so well that on December 21st, they're done. They're ahead of schedule. Everything's going great. They can just sit back and, and, and pray and rest and wait for the service. December 23rd, pastor goes to the church just to double check, make sure everything's going in. When he walks in, he comes in and he sees behind the pulpit, the drywall is all on the floor. They had had a leak that had been raining and snowing for the last two and a half days that they didn't know about. It was devastating. He cleans it up. Doesn't know for sure what he's going to do. Doesn't want to cancel the service. He said, we got to figure out something. He leaves to go talk to his wife. And as he's walking home, he goes by a thrift shop. And in this thrift shop, he just feels like God is telling him to go in the thrift shop. Sometimes God will do that. Not necessarily the voice where he says, but sometimes that still small voice will direct us to a place that we don't always understand. So he goes into the thrift shop, starts looking around. And he finds a handmade crochet tablecloth. Gorgeous. It is, it is just gorgeous. It's about 20 feet long and about 8 feet wide. And he says it'll cover the wall. Takes it home. Or takes it back to the church. But on the way to the church, there's a lady sitting on the bus stop who just missed her bus. She's waiting another 45 minutes to get the bus. It's rainy, snowy, nasty, cold outside. And he says, why don't you come in and sit in the church? Well, of course she's going to come and sit in the church because it's cold and nasty out there. So she comes and sits in the church. He starts putting this up. He gets it all the way up. He steps back and admires it and says, yeah. But as he's sitting there, 
the lady in the back pew starts walking forward. She gets about halfway up and stops, and he turns around and says, You okay? And she says, Yeah, but will you do me a favor? He says, Sure. She said, Go up in the bottom right hand corner and see if the initials E, P, G are there. Okay. So he goes up, bottom right hand corner, puts it open, E, P, G. She proceeds to tell him that she made that. And that she lived in Austria during the start of World War II. And she was a well-to-do family. And her and her husband had made a decision to leave before they were invaded and come to America. She was going to leave a week early. Husband was leaving a week after. She left, but never made it, and was arrested and put in prison. So she told this story, and the pastor's like, do you want it? Because you can have it. She's like, no, you need it. You keep it. It's just good to see that it still exists and it still can be used. He says, you know, i, I got to do something for you. Let me take you home. Because she was in Brooklyn only once a month. She lived in Queens. So he drove her home. She was up her age. He helped her up to her second-story apartment. Got her all the way up there, helped her up there, got her in and left and said thank you for it and went home. Next day, Christmas Eve, service, wonderful. Oh, what a great day. Had this glorious service. Everything's fine. Pastor does what Pastor does. He's at the back greeting everybody as they come out and everything's going well. And, and there's a guy in the third row that's just staring at the front of the church. Okay. He sort of knew him because he'd seen him in the community a few times. But as everybody's out, is out except for him and his wife and this man, he walks up to the man and says, you okay? And he says, I can't believe it. There's two of them. The pastor's like, what do you mean, two of them? He goes, the tablecloth. My wife made one just like that. 35 years ago. And he proceeded to tell how him and his wife lived in Austria. And that how she was there. She left early and he said, I left a week later and got arrested and we were both coming to America and we never seen each other after that. Now you know how the story goes. This is the, the, the greatest thing in the world. This, this, this pastor just gets to give a gift that is phenomenal. I mean, could you imagine? You're, you're the pastor. You, whoever. You're going to give a gift like this where you get to take this guy and the pastor said, we go with you. I want to take you for a ride. Okay. Takes him to Queens. You live in Brooklyn. You're not going to Queens. He goes to Queens. He takes him up two flights. I, I just wonder what he said before he knocked on the door. Hopefully he found out if he had a heart condition, because this is good enough that car. <laughs> but he knocks on the door, and she opens it. Wow. See, being kind allows us to be involved in miracles. Now, they may not be as big as that one, but sometimes a miracle is just talking to your neighbor when they're having a bad off. Just being kind. That's what God wants us to be. Just be kind. 